Well, folks, it's time. Let's lock in our predictions for the worst and tomorrow the best cards of Alterac Valley. This is where we set the historical record so that five, ten, a hundred years from now, you can come back and mock me when I told you that Wing Commander Itchman was the worst card in Alterac Valley. And you say, no, Regis, don't you remember the Ickman meta that we all all feared and dreaded for for years he dominated standard format that's right these are the 10 worst cards in no particular order that i think we'll see out of alterac valley and for this video i did try to include some class cards and legendary cards specifically uh, clearly you could pick like 10 random neutrals and say they're the 10 worst but for the sake of conversation and a good faith effort to put myself out there a little bit I picked some legendaries and class cards as well, and I tried to pick one card that some people seem to like a lot, but I don't think we'll get there. Hey, real quick, before we jump into the rest of this video, I want to let you know I've, I've been playing some other games. I love Hearthstone still, but I've been trying to dabble in other games over on my variety channel, Regis Chillbin, because I'm so chill. And I wanted to I wanted to let you know, like recently I finished a series on uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. It was a great game. I put together a few... But I think are pretty fun videos, hopefully pretty entertaining highlights, funny moments, bugs, uh, little storylines and stuff. Uh, I think you'll get a little taste of the game without having to you know, watch a 20 hour gameplay stream. So there's links down in like the description or uh, comments down there if you want to check that out. Uh, let me know what you think about those videos. If you'd like to see more, of course, you can drop a sub over there. And uh, the more views and support those get, the more I can make. So I uh, appreciate that. That said, let's uh, let's jump back into this video thing. All right, so all that said, let's uh, let's kick this off with Ickman here. And uh, again, these are no order. This could be the worst, could be 10th, whatever you you, you decide. But uh, Ickman's a nine mana hunter card. And that alone might have been reason, <laughs> reason enough to include him on this list. But I just don't see Ickman paying off enough here. Uh, so just a reminder, he summons you a beast, uh, gives it rush. If that beast takes a trade and kills something, then you get another beast. And same thing, repeat, repeat, repeat. So, you know, theoretically, you could get like a full board of big, scary beasts. Reality, I think, tells a different story. Uh, your opponent might only have one or two minions out. They may be big enough at, by the time you get to turn nine that there aren't good uh, kill trades to take. So you might get stranded where you just get like one or two beasts that aren't really all that impactful for nine mana. Beyond that, you have to have all these beasts in your deck. How many are you running? Did you already draw them all by turn nine? There aren't that many good options. There's like the new big frosty bear, mountain bear, whatever. Death Rattle Beast, there's a few other things. You could do like King Crush technically, maybe try to go face with it instead, but then you're not getting the repeat. I, like, I don't understand the deck construction of it. You just have to have such a density of beasts to make this worth it. If they're small beasts, it's probably not gonna be worth it because you're not swarming the board enough. You're not taking the trades that you need to by the time you get to turn nine. Uh, and then all, all that said, it's turn nine. You need to be like really winning the game. And I don't know that a board like this is enough. You know, compared to something like Nazoth, uh, and that one, you're happy to play your stuff along the way. You've got armor gain. You've got big, like very specific effects and abilities and a diversity of things. You can have backup plans. You don't have to have it in deck. Th this just feels like a way worse Nazoth in a lot of ways. Like, yes, in the perfect scenario where you have five giant beasts in deck and your opponent has a bunch of 1-1s on board, Ikman is amazing. But that's just not going to happen very often or ever. And in the meantime, you're just sitting on this nine mana card and all these really fat beasts in deck. I just... I don't see Ickman getting there at all. That seems really, really bad to me. So moving on here to the Storm Pike Aid Station, the objective for Priest, uh, and it's all about minion health buffs. Like all the, the objectives, it takes three turns to get full value out of this, and the thing for me is, is like, I don't think full value is very high on this. Like, plus two health per turn just isn't all that significant. Um... Like, yes, we saw some health buff synergy stuff pop into Priest, but if, if you're doing that, like, where you want to go wide and you want to summon a bunch of minions to realize as many buffs as you can off of this, you're going to be a faster deck, a tempo deck with cheap minions. Can a tempo deck spend three mana for things that don't pay off for a really long time? I don't see how. Like, if you're trying to play it on curve, you've just sacrificed a bunch of minion tempo. If you're playing it later in the game, like, the odds of your minions sticking around or having reloads for multiple turns in a row is so low. I just don't know where this card fits in. I think more immediate and more direct board buffs for health are where you'd really want to go, and there are some of those available. So Stormpack Gate Station just falls in this weird gap where it doesn't pay off enough, and it takes way too long to do it, 
And in the scenarios where it would be best, it just doesn't make sense because you want to play for tempo, and this is kind of an anti-tempo card. Moving on here to the Dire Wolf Commander. This is one of the kind of like boring neutrals I picked for this video. There's like three or four uh, that are probably really going to be the worst cards. And, uh, you know, it's just a boring neutral. It's like an arena style card. I, I mostly focus on honorable kill because I, I still believe honorable kill is going to be too hard to pull off. I think lining up exact damage isn't going to be as easy as we hope or that these cards power levels would sort of suggest. Uh, so for this one, you know, two health. Yeah, it's like a, how many two health things are laying around all the time? Not that many. And, you know, metas like kind of move around this stuff. So it's like. If this card ever became relevant, just start running more three health things or less two health stuff. You know, like don't run cult neophytes so much. It's minion based combat now. We don't need cult neophytes. So don't play those two health dudes, right? Play two threes instead. And it's like, oh shoot, man. Direwolf Commander <laughs> sucks. <laughs> and it probably will suck anyway. Uh, now it's like a two five for three. Like some people will get caught up on that, but I just don't think it'll ever reliably summon anything. And there's just better three drops for almost anybody to play that have effects that are reliable and more immediate. So. Uh, yeah, pick your poison on any of these like honorable kill neutrals that seem underwhelming. This one's as bad as the rest, but maybe no worse. All right, so next up, this is the legendary thing a lot of people like more than I do. So I'm going to go out on a limb here, probably even against my own review, and say that Tamsin's Phylactery just isn't going to get there. Now, is this really one of the 10 worst cards? No, of course. Like I said, a lot of the neutrals and stuff uh, would rank below this, but for the sake of, you know, Putting myself out on a limb, making a big, bold claim here. I'm going to say Tamsin's Phylactery is one of the 10 worst cards. And the reason for that is kind of twofold. So number one, I think this is like best case, you know, a soul of the forest or maybe a slightly better soul of the forest where you're in a class that probably doesn't have as many ways to leverage a card like soul of the forest. It's harder to get wide boards in Warlock, and it's harder to turn those wide boards into, like, lethal outputs. So even though, like, technically you could have an egg that makes this, like, 4-4 uh, Soul of the Forest or something, I still think it's going to be harder to get there and harder to follow up, even if you get those 4-4s. Like, do you have the Savage Roars and the Burst Damage and the Arbor Ups to, to leverage that into a victory? There's, there's some available in Warlock, certainly, but not as efficient as in Druid. And, you know, there are still board clears out there in the world. So uh, I think this just doesn't uh, sort of evolve on that so soul of the forest world enough. Now, there is the other, like, value side of this where you can do fun stuff like Rustwicks and get a bunch of primes in your deck. That's just too value and too slow, I think, for current Hearthstone. You really are going to probably want to play this as more of a board stabilization sort of card as opposed to an infinite value card. Now, I will play it as an infinite value card because that sounds freaking amazing and fun but it's not going to be the way this gets played competitively so i'm just going to go out on a limb here since this is a legendary one of it lacks the consistency warlock lacks the kind of deck building support around this and it has this conditionality where you kind of need the right death rattles to have died to make this good so that's going to push it towards the late game where it has a lower impact it's going to lack the consistency it needs and warlock just maybe doesn't have the support pieces for this so across those three things, even though like in a vacuum, there's a lot about this that makes sense. And that's why people like it. I actually think Tamsin's Phylactery might just fall short. And uh, this is my big, big stamp. This card sucks, even though it doesn't. But I'm going to say that so that you guys can come back and make fun of me. This is my bold claim of the video. All right, next up is the Desecrated Graveyard. We got another objective here, three mana. Uh, this one's for Warlock. This one will destroy your lowest attack minion and summon a 4-4 in its place. It does it three times. So, you know, best case scenario, I guess you like kill some eggs and get some 4-4s four or, I mean, 1-1s one -ones and get some 4-4s, four right? Uh, that said, again, I think this card just has way too slow of a payoff. Like if you're trying to play a swarmy egg deck or, you know, play a bunch of 1-1s one -ones and stuff, I don't think you're going to be willing to give up three mana for this thing that pays off like two or three turns down the line where it really becomes worth it i mean theoretically i guess if you played an egg on two 
this is an okay turn three to just like summon a four four but then it almost becomes a liability it's like you have to keep playing more eggs or more small stuff or it's just gonna destroy something halfway decent like the last four four that you summoned so i i feel like this could almost create problems for you as well on top of not even being that great when it actually works. And if you don't have that egg on two, it's like, oh God, I played a three, two. Now this thing's just dead on three. Like I don't want to turn this three, two into a four, four for three mana. Like sure, it's an upgrade, but not a three mana upgrade. You'd rather just play a three drop, right? And I think that's what most decks will find is they just rather push the actual tempo as opposed to like setting up for this like mediocre upgrades over the course of three turns. And here's another uh, neutral, honorable kill dude, the Frantic Hippogriff. Uh, it's it's a five mana three seven. Like if it gets honorable kill, okay, it's now a three seven with Wind Fury. That's really not that interesting. Uh, it's not going to be able to swing that many boards by the time you get to five mana. You're not going to be left with anything particularly threatening left behind. And this just doesn't keep up with the pace of modern Hearthstone. We have way bigger faster plays, including <laughs> Rush Wind Fury ones uh, that have been more successful in the past. So I, I just don't see how the Frantic Hippogriff competes with the things we're pumping out at five mana and so on on Hearthstone these days. I'm sure this is an okay arena card or something. I don't even know if it is, but <laughs> it's like not gonna get there in Constructed. Again, not particularly any crazy worse than other honorable kill neutrals that are kind of throwaways, but just as bad, I think. So our next legendary here is Karia Felsoul. Uh, man, I just don't get this card. Like, it, it's not like, well, I don't know. It's probably pretty bad. It's a six man six six battle cry. Transform into a six six copy of a demon in your deck. So I think there's like one demon that I think is really good for this, which is Pit Commander. Like, if you play this and you get Pit Commander, I think you're probably pretty happy because you basically got a Pit Commander effect uh, a little earlier than you would have otherwise had to. That said, there are other five and six mana ways we're finding out to cheat out demons that would also result in a pit commander. And I don't know that Karia Felsoul does it any better, but as I look through like all the other demons, the results are just, you know, mediocre at best, I think. And in some cases don't really seem to advantage you at all. And does that mean she's like the worst of the cheating your big demon stuff out of deck cards? Because she's a one of, like, do you really need her? She's six mana, so she's not as fast as other options. I have a feeling what's gonna happen is, is like between all the big demons and the big demon cheat out stuff, she's gonna be like the least exciting. There's gonna be other ways to do it that just make more sense, that are stickier, more reliable. Uh, so to me, Karya Felsel, I mean, I guess she's not like awful. Maybe she's bad for this list, but for a legendary, she sure seems kind of boring and not that much upside compared to like, other ways to achieve the exact same game plan. Moving on here to Rogue with the Lobotomizer. Uh, two mana, two, two weapon, of course. Honorable kill here. That gives you a copy of the top card of your opponent's deck. So, you know, I, ideally here, it's like, oh, I killed a little thing, great. I get some resources for Burgle stuff, great. And maybe even a little bit of uh, scouting for my opponent's top card, great. The reality is, it's gonna be really hard to trigger this honorable kill. Uh, you're going to be sacrificing tempo in the meantime to gain a random card that is very likely to be non-synergistic for your deck and not all that useful. Uh, theoretically enables Burgle stuff, but I think there are better ways to do that. And this is just too high of a price to pay because the stats on this weapon aren't good enough uh, to make up. I'd just rather run the the, the one mana weapon you got in in uh, Dead Mines, the tradable thing. Like... That also can get you a card if you need to, but you don't have to commit to trying to find these honorable kills that don't always line up. So basically the upside on this isn't worth it for the inconsistency of the honorable kill. And at a base level, there are just way better weapons and options if you're looking to find resources or alternate lines of play. And I certainly don't think the scouting has much advantage here at all. Like yes, occasionally you could steal some amazing legendary or something, but even then, it, you know, the more powerful the card you, well, not even steal, copy, uh, the more the more interesting card you copy, probably the later in the game it's going to make an impact and you've kind of made some sacrifices along the way trying to focus on value instead. So basically, all in all, uh, this just seems like it's going to be very awkward and uh, kind of reward you in the wrong way, you know, value over tempo. 
Next up here, we have our, our, our last, I think, uh, honorable kill, neutral minion, the Sneaky Scout. Um, you know, two minute, three, two stealth. Okay, that's something, but there's better stealth options. I'd rather run that three one that gives you another three one stealth in hand. If you're playing for stealth stuff, that's just more consistency. The honorable kill upside here, it's like you don't even really want to take it. Usually if you're playing stuff like this, you want it to go face. You don't really want to trade it. And then it's like, yeah, I mean, hero powers costing zero can be good, but they're usually good in decks that are trying to leverage that in some really specific way. I don't think any deck that's trying to do that really needs a sneaky scout taking trades on board. And then if it doesn't have honorable kill, yeah, just an average minion, right? So uh, I think there's better ways to do like all of these effects essentially. And in that case, no deck will really need to run sneaky scout. Alrighty, so last up here, we've got Seraphine Fleet Runner, uh, the Burgle centerpiece for Rogue. Uh, problem is, uh, this is a cool effect. I love it. Like, it's really fun, but uh, inconsistency is the problem. And actually, I think it comes down a little too late is another problem uh, at five mana. Like, by the time you get to five mana, a lot of decks have already really focused in on their game plan. They're nearing their win conditions. And it's like you're just kind of starting yours. And I, I don't think this offers enough recovery uh, to bring that back because yes, the minions are going to be lower costed and that is a great tempo advantage, but they're random. So getting things that fit certain game states or drive towards a specific game plan or victory state is not that likely. You're going to get a haphazard mix of things. They're not all going to work together. Some will totally suck and that's not going to give you the pressure or the recovery that you need to pull a game back towards victory. Will it be fun? Yes, of course, most of the cards on this video are going to be amazing to play because they're going to be fun. I do not, on the other hand, though, think it will be good. It still seems very weak to me and uh, just a little bit too passive and unpredictable to really be a competitive Hearthstone card. And uh, yeah, there you go. That's it for my 10 worst Stormwind. No, not Stormwind. My God, Alterac Valley. <laughs> I forgot what expansion ran. I saw those Alliance banners. Uh, Ten worst Alterac Valley cards. Now, listen. I mean, again, like some of these legendaries really aren't in the bottom ten, but I, I wanted to put myself out there, like I said. So, um, you know, maybe they're the worst of the legendaries that I could think of, at least. That said, I'm I'm curious. What cards do you think are gonna, uh, you know? destroy my expectations here and succeed to an enormous degree and make me the mockery of all YouTube peoples. Share those thoughts in the comments below. I'm very curious to hear. Also, what other cards do you think people are overrating are going to be really bad and, and maybe deserve a spot on this list much to uh, the community's uh, dismay? I think a Rokara is a really common uh, suggestion for bad cards. We'll talk about Rokara more in a, in a video where I rank the hero cards, but I didn't think she quite deserved uh, bottom tier status here. So anyway, share those thoughts. Thanks as always for watching. And until next time, game on.